The events in this video take place in the year 2021 in Great Britain. Bobby Ann McLeod, 18, told her parents she was leaving home to meet her boyfriend, but hours later it became clear that she had disappeared. Her family contacted the police, and a massive search began the next day, which eventually led to the gruesome discovery. Bobby Ann, along with her parents, Donna and Adrian, and brother Lee, lived in Plymouth. Plymouth is a lively coastal town located in the southwest of England. It has a rich history and maritime heritage that stretches back many centuries. From its stunning waterfront to its vibrant downtown, Plymouth is a popular destination for tourists and locals alike. On November 20th, 2021, at approximately 5.45 p.m., Bobby Ann walked out of her home in an area called Liam and headed to the nearest bus stop on Sheep Store Road. As she left, she told her father that she loved him and told him she was going downtown, where she planned to meet her boyfriend and their mutual friends. It only took Bobby Ann a few minutes to get to the bus stop. She was familiar with the route because she had taken it so many times. When it had been an hour and a half since Bobby Ann had left the house, her mother Donna texted her asking if she was okay and if she had gotten to where she had planned to go. Without an answer, a worried Donna tried to call her daughter, but Bobby Ann wasn't answering her phone either, and that wasn't usual at all. It was another hour or so before Bobby Ann's boyfriend called her parents and asked if their daughter was home. He was worried because Bobby Ann hadn't shown up for her date, and all his attempts to contact her by phone had been unsuccessful. After calling all of their daughter's known friends, and realizing that no one knew where she might be, Bobby Ann's parents began to realize that something bad might have happened to her. They immediately went to the police and reported her missing. It was already after 9 p.m. The next day, November 21st, police began a search of the area, which also involved McLeod's family and volunteers. Leaflets depicting Bobby Ann were distributed throughout the city. Her disappearance was reported on social media and in the popular media. Her brother, Lee McLeod, wrote on his social media page, I'm begging every single person in Plymouth to help me search everywhere searching for everything. Please, please, people, if you hear anything or see anything, tell me. Knowing that Bobby Ann was supposed to take a bus downtown, police quickly found out that she hadn't boarded any. However, while interviewing people, the officers learned from a local resident that he had driven by the bus stop the previous evening and had seen Bobby Ann there. The implication was that she had definitely made it to the bus stop, but had not boarded the bus for some reason. The evidence that she was indeed at the bus stop was soon corroborated. They found wireless headphones in the walkway behind the bus stop that were determined to be Bobby Ann's. The bus stop area was cordoned off. Police officers were literally on their knees searching the entire surrounding area for possible evidence. Evidence was also searched on the girl's route from her home to the bus stop and on all nearby streets. Given that Bobby Ann was at the bus stop but never boarded the bus, that her headphones were found near the bus stop, and several other details that police did not disclose, authorities began to speculate that the girl might have been kidnapped. Police appealed to anyone who had any information useful to the investigation to come forward. A large number of officers were involved in the search, doing all they could to find Bobby Ann as quickly as possible. Investigators attempted to trace the location of her cell phone, which revealed that the device was in the city limits but they could not find out exactly where. All calls to Bobby Ann's number were forwarded to voicemail. That same day, the girl's phone ended up in the possession of the police. It was given to the police by the driver of the bus that was on the route where the bus stop that Bobby Ann disappeared from was located. As it turned out, a local resident came to the same bus stop at 7.15 p.m. the previous evening and found the phone and an AirPods case there. At 7.23 p.m., a bus arrived and the man handed the items he found to the bus driver, assuming the owner would look for them. When the bus driver saw the next day that Bobby Ann was missing and last seen standing at the bus stop, he contacted the police and handed them the phone and AirPods case. The next day, November 22nd, 
Police, family, and volunteers searched the fields, woodlands, and roads surrounding the area where Bobby Ann lived, but no clues were found. The next evening, November 23rd, police announced that a woman's body had been found at Bovisan Beach about eight miles from the bus stop. It was found in a wooded area about half a mile from the shore. During the identification process for the McLeod family, the worst thing was confirmed. The body found belonged to Bobby Ann. Her death was a heavy blow to family and friends. The family thanked everyone who came to the vigil in memory of Bobby Ann, which was held near the bus stop where she was last seen. Donna McLeod, the mother of Bobby Ann, sobbed as she paid tribute to her daughter and thanked friends, family, and the wider community for their support. Surrounded by other family members, her voice trembled, but she completed a prepared statement. She said, I would like to thank everyone for coming, on behalf of the family. It's nice everyone is coming together in the circumstances. Unfortunately, our beautiful Bobby Ann has been taken from us, but she will never be forgotten. I'd like everyone to hold their candles up. This is for Bobby Ann. This was followed by a moment of silence as the entire crowd held up their candles in unison. Bobby Ann's brother, Lee McLeod, shared a heartbreaking childhood picture of the two of them, paying tribute to his beautiful and talented sister. The picture showed the two siblings smiling in their primary school uniforms. In a message posted with the picture, Mr. McLeod wrote, Until we meet again, sis, I love you. You didn't deserve this, such a beautiful and talented girl, and to have you as my little sister, the adventures and journeys we had will always be treasured. Now go rest easy. When police found the body, it was naked, but the medical examiner concluded that there was absolutely no indication that Bobby Ann had been raped before she died. There were serious injuries on her head and face, namely 14 lacerations. It is unknown how long the police would have searched for Bobby Ann's body had it not been for one event. On November 23rd, the very day the body was found, a man walked into the downtown police station. This happened at 1.17 p.m. Upon entering, he asked if he could talk to someone and told them that he had information about the missing girl and that he wanted to help the police and her family. A detective was called, and when he arrived, the man said, I did it. He confessed to having kidnapped and taken Bobby Ann's life and gave some details of the crime committed. After he indicated on a map the place where he had left the body, Police officers, who harbored hopes that Bobby Ann might still be alive, immediately drove there. Unfortunately, their hopes were not realized when the inspectors made their way through the dense undergrowth and found the body, which was naked and lying face down. There was no doubt that the girl was dead. The man who confessed to the horrific crime was 24-year-old Cody Ackland. He was the son of an ex-military man who stayed with his mother after his parents divorced. In fact, he lived only a few miles from the bus stop where Bobby Ann was last seen. Cody Ackland was arrested as a suspect. A lawyer issued a statement on his behalf that read, I take full responsibility for Bobby Ann's death. Ackland also said in the statement that he had never met the victim before that unfortunate evening and confirmed that he was the one who had abducted the girl from the bus stop. His car, phone, computer, and several other items were seized by police. To anyone who knew Cody Ackland, he was a good guy, guitarist and songwriter for the local indie rock band Rakuda. No one knew that Ackland was into more than just music, but also serial killers from around the world. His personal list of idols included Joseph D'Angelo Jr., Andre Chikatilo, Ivan Milat, Fred West, and Tommy Sells. Number one in Ackland's personal ranking, however, was Ted Bundy, whom the number of his victims is not known, but there were at least 30 of them. It was Ted Bundy and his atrocities that Ackland paid the most attention to. Investigators uncovered 3,216 images on Ackland's phone, many of a disturbing and dark nature and reminiscent of horror films. In the days and weeks leading up to Bobby Ann's death, Ackland searched the internet for information about serial killers' crimes. He also browsed for remote locations on Dartmoor and for potential weapons. On the day of Bobby Ann's abduction, Ackland was visiting the website of an online sports store where he browsed baseball bats, ski masks, and waterproof clothing. 
It is important to note that despite his clandestine hobbies, Cody Ackland had never come to the attention of the police, nor had he been in any trouble with the law. Apparently, he went so far in his secret hobby that he decided to commit a serious crime. It has come to be seen that Bobby Ann was an accidental victim who by an evil coincidence ended up in the way of Ackland, who that evening, like a vicious beast, went searching for a prey. The events of that evening unfolded as follows. Bobby Ann arrived at the bus stop at about 6.15 p.m. Ackland, who was driving his Ford Fiesta around the neighborhood, spotted her at the stop. As he later told detectives, Bobby Ann resembled his ex-girlfriend in appearance, but that resemblance, according to Cody himself, was not the emotional trigger that motivated him to attack. He was simply looking for a victim and wanted to carry out his long-held plans. The police also concluded that if Ackland had not met Bobby Ann, he would still have carried out his plan. The victim could have been anyone, regardless of gender. That's what the police believed. Thus, when Ackland saw Bobby Ann, he parked his car in the road behind the bus stop. After watching her for a few minutes and making sure no one else was around, Ackland took his pre-purchased hammer, crept up to Bobby Ann, and struck her twice in the head. Then, thinking she was dead, Eklund returned to his car and was about to leave the scene. Unfortunately, as he drove away, he saw that Bobby Ann was alive and trying to get up, so he went back to the bus stop, moved her semi-conscious body to his car, and drove her 20 miles away to the Belliver Forest parking lot in Dartmoor. At 7.45 p.m., he stopped at this parking lot, which is in the middle of a wooded area. He wanted to leave the body there, but found that Bobby Ann was still alive and conscious. Unfortunately, Ackland didn't think twice. He didn't try to get help or take Bobby Ann to the hospital. Instead, he helped her out of the car. Miss McLeod told him, I am scared, to which he responded, So am I. I've never done this, before striking her 12 times on the head. Trying to destroy evidence, Ackland burned Bobby Ann's purse. After bashing Bobby Ann McLeod a dozen times with a claw hammer, Cody Ackland marveled how the 18-year-old was still able to make a noise, later telling police he thought, wow, I mean, hats off to you. He had one more chance to try to save Bobby Ann's life, but again Ackland did not take it. Instead, he said, he put an end to the girl's suffering. He then loaded the body into the trunk of his car and drove to Bovisand, traveling nearly 30 miles. There he hid the body after removing his shoes, clothing, and jewelry. At about 10 p.m., Ackland arrived home and went to bed. The next day, he drove to Tamerton Foliot, north of Plymouth, threw the hammer into River Tamar and a carrier bag containing his and her bloodstained clothing into nearby allotments in Coombe Lane. The hammer was never recovered despite a thorough police search. That same day, November 21st, Ackland went to a pizza place with friends, attended his band's rehearsal, and spent most of the night in the pub. Everyone who saw Cody that day remarked on his unusually good mood. He was happy, joking, and hugging his friends, which was rare for him. The next day, November 22nd, Ackland continued to have fun. He bought popcorn and went to the movie theater. While he watched the movie, Police, family, and volunteers searched for Bobby Ann, and Ackland tracked the latest news with his phone. On November 23rd, Cody was at his non-music-related job. If the English papers are to be believed, he was working for a car service company. After leaving for his lunch break, Ackland sent a message to a chat room where members of the music group Rakuda were. He wrote, Love you guys. At the same time, he texted his mother that he loved her very much after which he went to the police station and confessed to the crime. Ackland's bandmates issued a statement on Facebook which said they would be disbanding the group immediately as a mark of respect to the late teenager. It added, The remaining members of Rakuda, Josh, Ross, Josh and Mike are all extremely shocked and in complete disbelief by the tragic event that has unfolded over the last several days. Our thoughts and prayers are with Bobby Ann McLeod's family and friends, who must be devastated at their loss. As a mark of respect, we have decided that we shall not be going forward as a band and will be disbanding with immediate effect. We will not be making any further comments at this time. 
In addition to Ackland's confession, police had a wealth of physical evidence, including Bobby Ann's DNA found in his car and on sneakers recovered from his home. As for motive, Detective Mike West, who led the investigation, said Ackland refused of going into detail about his motive and avoided answering the question of why he killed Bobby Ann. At the same time, the detective did not rule out the possibility that, after thinking about what he had done, Ackland might in the future become more forthcoming and give more details. He would later tell a psychiatrist the feelings of depression he had felt before murdering Miss McLeod had now gone and was not feeling the same resentment as before, as if this violent act has rid him of these feelings. The trial took place in May 2022. Ray Tully, Ackland's attorney, said that psychiatrists had found his client was not suffering from mental illness, but said he had struggled during childhood. Ackland was diagnosed with ADHD, dyslexia, depression, and anxiety, and by the age of 19, had a seven-year depressive history, Mr. Tully said. He said Ackland had not received much comfort from either his home or his school life, and that his father and other male role models had not provided much in the way of sucker or support. On sentencing, Judge Robert Linford told Ackland that his act was determined savagery, saying that he was satisfied from the evidence that he intended to kill. This was a prolonged and awful ordeal for this poor person. She had the whole of her life in front of her until it was brutally and savagely snuffed out by you, he said. You were quite clearly planning murder and you did murder. Cody Ackland, 24, was sentenced to life in prison. He will spend 31 years in prison before he is eligible to apply for parole.